The research actually tells us that the therapeutic relationship that we have with a client or that a client has with their therapist is one of the biggest predictors of therapy outcome. So it is so important for a person to feel connected to whoever it is that they're seeing and, and speaking to for help. And if you go and see someone and you don't feel like they're the right fit for you for whatever reason, I would encourage people to keep trying and it might work. Hi, I'm Nicholas Bloom. Hi, I'm Dr. Anastasia Haronis. And welcome to Let's Talk Gambling. Today, we're going to speak about what to expect when seeing a counsellor. So, curious for you, Dr. A, um, I know that when I was initially trying to see a counsellor as an adult, it was a pretty difficult space to navigate. How would you inform someone on starting that process? Yeah, it's a good question. Good thing for us to be talking about because it really is one of the first steps in someone getting help and getting the help that they need. So I would be advising people to look at getting a referral for a therapist, whether that be a counsellor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, whatever someone's needing, but getting that referral from a trusted source. So if someone has a GP that they feel like they've got a good relationship with, going and asking them for advice as to who they can see, um, going to the gambling help websites and, and, you know, through their online resources, looking for referral options for a therapist, um, or even if someone's, you know, got a friend or family member who's had a good experience with a therapist and that's like a personal recommendation, mm. um, but, but finding someone from a trusted source. Cool. Okay. And so let's say a person's done that, they've gone through the process, they've found that therapist, like, can you speak to what that might look like a bit or the sort of questions they might ask? Yes. Yeah. So when you come and see a therapist for the first session, it's really an assessment. Um, so for me, if I have someone coming into the room for the first time, I often tell them, I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions today, obviously trying to build the rapport, make them feel as comfortable as possible and, and never any pressure for them to answer questions. But really, I want to get a sense of what's going on for a person in their life, um, why it is that they've come to see me and, and a bit of a picture as to what their life's looking like right now so that we can come up with a plan as to what's the best way to help them going forward. Okay, cool. And so let's say a person's experiencing gambling harm. Like, are there any specific ways a therapist could support them with that experience? Mm. I would first have a conversation with the person around what's their goal. And usually that might fall into two sort of categories. Some people, if it's in relation to gambling, want to go down the path of abstinence and not engaging in gambling at all. And that's their goal, which is great and fine. For other people, the goal might be harm minimization. So their desire is actually to continue gambling to a degree, but to reduce the harms and impact that it has on their life. And that can look somewhat different depending on the path that we go down, but um, it is an important conversation for us to have. I will often as well also just provide my opinion as to what I think might be better for that person. Um, the more serious uh, gambling related harms that they're experiencing, the more likely I would be to advise that we should at least try for a period of abstinence, even if it's just as a trial and an experiment, you know, no one really has to commit to it at that point, but let's try that and see how that works for you in, in your life and reassess as we go. Mm. Yeah, cool. And and like, obviously it's going to depend on the individual and their circumstances, but can you give a bit of an idea as to what that process might look like over a couple of weeks, a couple of months? Yes. Yeah. So for the general way that I work is that for anyone coming in reporting gambling related concerns, we would look first at having a period of time, say roughly maybe three months, mm -hmm. where we really focus on either having that person not gamble or reducing how much they gamble, again, depending on their goal. But those first few months are really us um, building skills. So me helping a person develop the skills to manage the urges that are going to come up when they reduce or stop their gambling, the uncomfortable feelings that come up when they reduce or stop their gambling. It's really about skill building. And once we have a period of stability where a person's feeling more confident in actually being able to manage their gambling, then I would say we start looking at what is underlying that. It's often the case mm -hmm. that um, gambling may not have been the first um, problem or difficulty for a person. Um, perhaps there has been a history of something like anxiety or depression or trauma or stress or family conflict or whatever it may be, and gambling has developed as a way to cope with those things. So we then delve into that. 
Mm, I understand. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious off the back of that, like, could you speak to a time where you specifically supported a person and like how you did it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a number of like, you know, clients that, that come to mind that, you know, I'm thinking of people who've had really quite serious difficulties with gambling where we've really taken that abstinence approach. And um, there are a lot of different types of therapies that can help. There's cognitive behaviour therapy, there's dialectical behaviour therapy, there's acceptance and commitment therapy. There's so many different types of therapies, but um, all of them involve helping a person build some skills. So whether that be we're teaching that person mindfulness skills, whether it be we're helping them um, with distress tolerance skills. So how do I sit with uncomfortable feelings? I'm thinking mm. of clients where we've really worked through a lot of those skills to establish a period of stability for them and then done some of that underlying emotional work, looking at any perhaps um, – unhelpful beliefs that a person might have, how we can start to be flexible with those, looking at how we can uh, navigate emotions and, and sit with uncomfortable emotions uh, or change uncomfortable emotions. Um, so I've said a lot of things, but there's, I guess that's to say that there's a lot of different skills, strategies, approaches that therapists can use with clients. Mm. Um, it's not necessarily a one size fits all, but for me, there is that general approach of period of stability, um, help a person reduce their um, urge and and um, engagement with gambling and then look at what's underlying that potentially. Mm. Yeah, it makes sense to me. We focus on the issue at the top and then we go beneath the surface for what's the deeper thing that's going on. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Yeah, off the back of that, I was just thinking about my own personal experience. And yeah, as an adult, I remember that when I wanted to see a psychologist or a therapist, first things first, really difficult process to navigate and I wasn't really sure where to go or who to turn to. Uh, and then secondly, I did find a therapist after quite a long wait time, uh, saw him and didn't really feel a connection. Mm. And so the challenge for me has been working out like to have a level of patience and a level of persistence, but like I've found that difficult to navigate. Like, yeah. could you speak to that a bit? Yeah, that's a really good point. And the research actually tells us that the therapeutic relationship that we have with the client or that a client has with their therapist is one of the biggest predictors of therapy outcome. So mm. it is so important for a person to feel connected to whoever it is that they're seeing and, and speaking to for help. And if you go and see someone and you don't feel like they're the right fit for you for whatever reason, I would encourage people to keep trying. And it might might take a few goes before you find that person that um, feels like, you know, that, that you feel like you connect with, but also you feel really heard and, and sort of seen and understood by them. And the wait time is a really important point. Sometimes it can actually be difficult to get in to see a therapist or the therapist that you do want to see. Um, in which case, I'd encourage people to utilise online resources in the meantime, um, rather than just sort of sitting and waiting to see a therapist. There's so much... Um, you know, evidence-backed information and kind of self-help options that are available online um, that I would really encourage people to sort of see if, if some of those might be beneficial for them while they wait to see someone. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm interested in that. Like in that interim period, let's say I'm waiting six months to see a therapist, is there any way you could guide me or another person to? Yeah, yeah. I would be saying if you've got a GP, like be checking in with them, mm -hmm. you know, a bit more regularly. It can be hard to get in with the GP as well sometimes, but if people can, like use the people that are available to them. So a GP is a good trusted source. Um, online materials, there's, you know, a lot that um, the Gamblers Help website have put out. We've got a lot of blog posts up there that are short snippets of information, but also strategies. We talk about mindfulness, how to manage urges, um, how to live life in line with your values. So there are online options to be sort of um, looking to, to help a person reflect on um, how they can help themselves in that interim. Mm, cool. Yeah, that got me thinking. Um, when I was growing up, I experienced some struggles, some bullying, um, had a challenging time at school and I remember speaking about it with my mum and she's like, let's go see the school counsellor. And so we did that. And at the time, like as a young person, it was, it was a bit weird. Um, I remember going to this guy's office and I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. He's asking me all these questions. The environment was just like, it was kind of this dark room. I was like, what's going on? But by the end of it, I walked out and I was like, huh, like, someone's actually listened to me outside of my mum. Mm. 
Yeah. Someone's actually like seen and heard me outside of my mum. So it was a pretty cool experience in hindsight. Yeah. It's um it's one of those things that going to see a therapist is not an a normal natural interaction, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Like as a as a client, you go in and you speak to someone, you're sharing a lot of really personal information with someone you've never met before, you don't know who they are. And it's not a reciprocal interaction in that the therapist is not usually then sharing much back with a person. You know, when someone comes to see me, I'm not telling them about my life or what I did that day or or that week. Um, So that's not how most normal interactions with people go, Um, particularly ones that are quite emotional and and where we're being vulnerable. Most most interactions kind of go, I share a little bit, you share a little bit, and then we kind of build on that. And that's how trust builds in a relationship. So that is to acknowledge that it might feel quite uncomfortable for people at the start. Um, I would also say to someone, um, place that trust in the hands of the therapist. Like we know that it's not a, a always comfortable experience for someone. Sometimes people come in, they are happy to share and tell us everything. And for other people, they're sort of just like tiptoeing along the way. And that is totally fine. Like for me, I'm always willing to match someone where they're at. And that might mean it takes a few more sessions to get all that information until someone really feels comfortable in my presence to open up and share. And that is so okay. Mm. Non-reciprocal, like that really speaks to the experience. When I saw that psychologist as an adult, I was like, I want to know more about you. Like, I want to get more of an understanding. Like, I want this to be more of a conversation. I feel like you're just interviewing me. And so that's why I was really uncomfortable. And it's probably the reason I didn't go back. Yeah. So I feel like you explaining the steps of the journey and what that looks like is a bit of a motivator for me to realise it's just one session. Yeah. How much could they really do in one session? I need to go more consistently. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. And I'll often say to people in that first session, you might not get, a lot from me, even in terms of like therapeutic skills and things to take away, because that might depend on, you know, what it is that you actually want out of this, but come sort of second and third session where we really start on some sort of treatment plan. That's when you're sort of getting more from me, but definitely that first session for some people can feel uncomfortable, but hopefully gets easier. And if you do feel like you have that connection, as I said before, the relationship is such a big predictor of therapy outcomes. So if you don't feel like after a couple of sessions, you're gelling with that person, try someone else. Choose your own adventure. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you, Dr. A. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Let's Talk Gambling and what to expect when seeing a counsellor. Dr. A, you got a few bullet points you can sum up for us. Yeah, so a few key takeaways. Seeing a therapist for the first time can be a bit of a daunting experience, but it also can be a really useful one. So I encourage you, if you are struggling with your relationship with gambling, to reach out and get some support. Um, A therapist can work with you, depending on what your goals are, to help you reach those goals and outcomes. Um, And if you are looking for referral options, you can go to the Gambler's Help website and they will be able to work with you and pair you with a therapist that's suitable for your needs and that you're going to connect with. Nice one. See you soon and we'll see you soon too. See you next time.